that's really the best thing about Pagely. It's like, not only is the infrastructure great, but I mean, I, I submit a lot of support requests for things that most 99% of other WordPress hosts would not even think about uh, even supporting at all. Yeah, there's been one or two occurrences where that's happened. And that's something really cool too. Proactiveness, right? That's important. It's really yeah. cool that Pagely helps and you know gives us that um, extra level of support because we we tried to do it on our own for uh, the Nginx rules and we were just like, okay, this isn't working for us. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, custom yeah. situations or you need extra support uh, with super knowledgeable people. You don't want to maintain your own servers. Uh, you want to focus on your business. Um, which is at the core of what you do. Uh, move to Pagely. You know, I've tried Kinsta, SiteGround, WP Engine, Liquid, you name it, I've tried it. And no level of support has been as good as Pagely. Um, not to mention the architecture and the server system. Just everything's good. It's a little bit more pricey than some of the others, but you know, you get what you pay for. All right, hey everybody, welcome to the video case study number four. I'm here today with Devin Walker. Devin is founder of impress.org and has grown it to a team of more than 15 employees within two years of incorporation. In total, his software has been downloaded several million times and has accumulated more than 350 five-star reviews. He's best known for his creation of the Give WP uh, online fundraising platform built for WordPress. His work is being used by millions of websites and has been featured in Product Hunt, WP Tavern, Torque, and a couple other prestigious publications. Uh, he's an active community contributor through his code contributions, uh, his WordCamp and Meetup organization, and speaking efforts, as well as fostering and supporting popular online groups like Advanced WordPress and WordPress for Nonprofits. Welcome, Devin. Thank you. Appreciate cool. it. So I think we should start with GiveWP since it sounds like that's really the one uh, that you've had with us for the longest and we've got a lot of stuff that we can talk about on that one. Uh, first, can you just start by explaining what is GiveWP? Sure, so GiveWP essentially is an online fundraising platform that lives inside your WordPress website. You can do everything from, uh, of course, set up multiple donation uh, forms and campaigns according to you know, um, ongoing fundraising or event-based fundraising, for instance, uh, in the, coming up now is uh, Giving Tuesday in the holiday season. So, um, you know, you can schedule uh, goals to, to kick off and then you can also manage your donors and integrate with, uh, you know, more than 15 plus payment gateways right now. And uh, it's basically um, everything you need to fundraise if you're a nonprofit, a cause, or simply looking to raise money for um, some, you know, some event in your life. So yeah, that's, that's definitely our premier pl plugin. We work on it every day and, um, and our whole ecosystem of add-ons and the website, um, it's all hosted on Pagely. Yeah, cool. And so this is distributed software. It's plugins that people are downloading. And as best I can tell, I read through your support history of about 69 tickets, I think was the total. And most of the issues that I could tell stem from the fact this is calling back to your licensing server. And mm -hmm. there was various stuff related to uh, that, that fact that it was calling back and uh, we're getting some issues there. So we can talk through that. Um, I forgot to introduce Armand. <laughs> Armand Zacharyan is our uh, head of hosting ops. He's on the call as well. <laughs> Welcome Armand. Hello. And if we have any bells that your noises you hear in the background. Armand had a fire drill going on a minute ago, but I think it seems to be stopped. So I hopefully knock on wood, we're good there. Uh, but let's start out. So you guys were provisioned in, it looks like September 15th of 2017 was when the server got set up. Mm -hmm. um, and then a ticket that I'm looking at five days later, where we're talking about, uh, this is where the easy digital downloads, which is this, the system that you use for your licensing. It sounded like the endpoint was just getting hammered. Uh, mm. And Armand, are you able to talk about what we did in that situation with the rate limiting? Yeah, um, it's actually been quite a journey over the last couple of years with this endpoint. Um, so when they first uh, joined Pagely, uh, we hadn't yet been using the uh, our new Aries gateway, which is our take on 
uh, using Nginx uh, with block customizations to make it easy to apply different rules and better rate limiting and stuff. Uh, so when uh, when Devin's uh, site first joined Pagely, they were on our, our previous gateway. And um, that was more uh, in line with a pure Nginx, you know, sort of config style. Um, so the initial issue, I think, was simply that the real IP configuration wasn't set up right because they go through security uh, for their for their firewall. Uh, so that's just some Nginx configurations uh, to set up the real IP. Real IP is basically a uh, authorized list of IP addresses that are allowed to send an X forwarded for header so that your origin server knows what the real IP of the visitor is. Uh, so if you don't have that set up right, then if there are any rate limiting rules or anything that applies changes or policies on a per IP basis, it's going to lump all of those requests as coming from the IP of your sending proxy, not as uh, an individual IP address per visitor. Uh, so that was just an initial issue out the gate, just getting the real IP set up correctly uh, so that we could bucket each visitor the right way. Um, and then once we got that sorted out, there was definitely uh, a high volume of traffic for that endpoint. Uh, so the the rate limiting was not uh, mis mislabeling traffic anymore as coming from a single IP, uh, but there was still a lot of a lot of requests coming in overall. Um, and I think most of this most of this uh, case study will be talking about the different ways that that issue was uh, worked around and, and, and worked on from both sides, uh, from both Pagely uh, and with and with GiveWP. Uh, there was a lot of effort put into uh, making changes on both ends within the plugin itself, as well as on the hosting infrastructure uh, to sort of bring that under control. So um, if you want, we can dig into more detail on, on that ticket, or we can, uh, we can move on through, throughout the rest of the timeline. Yeah, well, I, I'd just like to get Devin from your perspective at this point. You know, you're five days into hosting with us, and it, it seems like you're getting rate limited. Uh, you know, our system thinks that all this traffic is coming from one IP address, uh, given that that we weren't passing that header through. Mm -hmm. um, so, what is once that's solved, and now it it is clear that there's still some other issues. Um, what are you guys thinking at this point? Like, are you thinking about code changes? Are you or you know, what's going through your, your mind basically at that point? Yeah, so, you know, the reason why I moved over to Pagely is because we aren't experts at hosting at all. I'm not a system engineer at all. And, you know, I know barely enough to be dangerous in that area. So we weren't getting any answers from our previous hosts about, you know, what we can do to mitigate this, how we could possibly, uh, you know, limit some of these requests coming in, throttle them, whatever term you want to use. Um, so when we moved over to Pagely, I knew, uh, you know, we'd get some more answers and we definitely have. Uh, but what I was thinking was, you know, it's just the first little hurdle to get over. Uh, I knew this wasn't going to be a quick fix. And um, it's definitely a lesson for, uh, you know, those trying to build a, a large business around a distributed plugin where they're, you know, they're checking, uh, they're calling home from, tens of thousands of WordPress websites hitting this endpoint, activating licenses, deactivating licenses, checking subscription statuses. Um, sometimes these WordPress sites out there have misconfigurations where they're checking updates um, in an extremely high frequency. And uh, you know some of those websites are um, owned by people who don't even know this. Um, so we try to reach out to them and see and help them out uh, as much as we can do that. But in the nature of, you know, how many customers we have, that can be difficult. So I got some really good answers and insights from the Pagely team, some good um, ways to troubleshoot on our end. Um, we have an internal doc that we have been um, compiling with ways to, you know, troubleshoot within our um, server environment. Um, but the initial thought, going back to your question, was, um, you know, I, I didn't really understand the whole issue, to be honest. I set real IP, I, I get it. 
now, much in two years later. Um, but it was good to get that attention and the help and, uh, and fast response time from that support. That's really the best thing about Pagely. It's like, not only is the infrastructure great, but I mean, I, I submit a lot of support requests for things that most 99% of other WordPress hosts would not even think about uh, even supporting at all. That's awesome. Was there any takeaway, like in retrospect and knowing what you know now, is there any lesson or any, anything that you wish you could have done differently in terms of how things were architected or any takeaway about the, the calling home mechanism or is... Yeah, I mean, we now are just finishing up our licensing proxy server, which um, you uh, guys have helped also redirect some of our staging traffic in our testing phase in the last couple uh, months for that. Um, and we're getting ready to roll that out live. Um, it's difficult because when you're launching a first product, like, you know, we launched this in 2014, early 2015, you know, we didn't really think about how over time, four years later, the growth of it could really cause this to happen. And I've spoken to a lot of other WordPress, uh, successful WordPress um, owners out there, and they have the same issue too. Um, and they've developed their own workarounds um, as well. But the thing is, it's such a niche type of problem to have that there's no other really solution other than, you know, not using that that product to sell your licenses or rolling your own mechanism. So, I mean, it's a fortunate problem. I would say like you did it the right way. Like it would be pre-optimization to worry about scale when you don't have scale yet. And, you know, to spend a bunch of cycles on something that's not even a problem yet. So it, it just seems like one of those things that you're lucky to bump into it because it means you've done something right with your product mm -hmm. that you're getting that much usage. Well, yeah, we, you know, we have this newer product called WP Business Reviews. It's not even near the scale of GiveWP. And I'm just thinking in my mind, you know, three years from now, we're, we're, we're going to be much better prepared since we already have the technology almost rolled out for GiveWP and we can kind of use that similarly. Um, but I know it's, it, it's a good problem to have and hopefully we do have that problem in a couple you know, years and we'll see that better. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. Well, so let's maybe, in, Armand, unless you have anything else to add on that one, I was thinking we'd go to the next one on October 20th. The yeah, I had, I had just one quick thing to add. Um, so just just to close the loop on that real IP thing and with, with popular uh, firewalls and CDNs out there like Security or Cloudflare, CloudFront, uh, our new our new Aries gateway actually sets up all the real IP stuff automatically. So that's that's a lesson we learned ourselves from a previous iteration of our product. We applied it to our new product, which automatically sets up that real IP stuff. So that just leads to less less problems at the gate for new customers now that we have that automatically being configured. So if you are signing through security or any of those other big popular ones, um, you know, we have that that part of it already set up out of the box. Can while we're on Aries, can you just what is the gist of the change with Aries? What does it do? What does it allow us to do differently versus the old gateway? And I know it's a lot. I know you can't just like wrap that up into a sentence, but like, what's the kind yeah. of the, the crux of it? So really, the big benefit to customers is any sort of customization that you need at the at the web server layer is is not a difficult thing for us to do we have we have systems in place and workflows in place and an entirely uh, customized way of expressing those rules on our side that makes it really easy for us to to set up anything that you need so we're not having to go into uh, some random nginx config file and setting up uh, you know these tricky rules and then having to put that into uh, some other configuration management system. You know our area system has configuration management built in. It's all tracked with Git. We have uh, automated tests that run against the rules before they're uploaded. Things like that. Uh, so we we basically uh, built the system where the, the edge case is not really the edge case. It's more of a stress case. And we can uh, really easily accommodate 
uh, custom settings that you may need for your site. That could be a subdirectory proxy. That could be um, uh, it could be custom rate limiting rules. It could be GOIP based redirects. It could be all kinds of things. Um, and those are you know it's just another day in the life uh, for us to set that kind of stuff up. Cool. Nice. All right, well, so let's jump to uh, October 20th. There was a ticket about uh, the downloads directory was caching. And I, it sounded like, Devin, you had some downloads and it was serving like antiquated versions instead of the newest versions. And then we discovered that that was caching. Mm -hmm. um, and that, Armand, that was, a, that was a fairly simple fix, right? That was just a rule to not cache that directory. Um, is there anything else to add? Like would Aries have made that simpler or what? Or, any, what, what else would you say about that situation? So this is something that you'll run into when you use any caching layer. Uh, if you're using CloudFront or if you're setting up Varnish or if you're setting up Nginx, uh, uh, Nginx's caching features. Uh, if you're caching content, then you need a way to purge that content when you, when you actually change the, the, the content on disk or update a post in WordPress or whatever. Uh, so for any dynamic content that's part of your WordPress site, your pages or your homepage or different categories, menus, things like that, anytime uh, there is a change that you make within WordPress, we have hooks that will automatically go and purge that from the cache uh, so that you know it'll go and get the new copy. Uh, when you're changing static files, obviously there's no there's no hook to to trigger because you're not doing that with your WordPress panel, you're logging in over SFTP or you're you know editing a file on disk. Uh, so if if that is a file you're updating frequently, then we, we can very easily set up rules to exclude caching for that specific item. Um, another way around it is to add a query string to the end of the URL. So my file zip slash VER or version equals, you know, uh, some string. Um, so if you have a query string like that at the end of your URL, that's considered a unique cache element. So it will go and, and get a fresh copy of that file. So that's another way to do it. Uh, and then the third way to do it is to make use of the, uh, the purge API that we have available. So if you do know that you uploaded a new copy of this file and you want to make sure that it's it's uh, clear from all the caches, then you can issue uh, the purge purge caches button inside of the WP admin panel. Uh, there's a whole section that's labeled Pagely uh, where you can where you can do those things, and you can purge your CDN. You can purge the press cache, which is the nginx based cache that's on your server. Um, and then we also provide a programmatic way to, uh, to to use the purge API within your WordPress plugins. You can make you can make use of that endpoint uh, in your plugin, or you can just do a WPCLI call uh, to purge the cache uh, for a specific path or for everything. Um, but yeah, so what we ended up doing for for this uh, particular case was just to set that URL to not cache. Uh, just it's a cache bypass, basically. Um, so that's fine to do if it's a static file and you know it, I'm just going to update this frequently. I don't want to deal with purging. I don't want to deal with query strings. That's fine. Um, we're a little more hesitant to bypass caching on things that are dynamic for obvious reasons, being if you have a lot of traffic going to an endpoint and that's running you know, as part of your WordPress application or it's running some PHP, um, if that workload is, is really intensive, then it can overload the, the server, it can overload your database. Uh, and that's one of the huge benefits to caching in general is to avoid the work for your application server. Um, but yeah, if it's just a static asset, it's, it's totally fine to uh, it's not really a big deal for us to set up a cache bypass uh, for specific things like that. Um, and so with Aries, how that's easier is, again, we're not having to implement or express that rule in Nginx sort of language. Um, it's still using Nginx, but we have, we have our own rules engine where we can express it as a match and an action. So we express this in JSON, we can say match URL, 
value of the URL is my file that's it. And then the action is set cacheable, no. And that's pretty much it. Um, I mean, so if you compare that to how you would be writing a rule inside of Nginx, uh, you have to take into account how all the location matches that are existing work. You have to take into account uh, how uh, any rule that you're you're adding to match this this file or this uh, folder, uh, how that may impact proxying of the requests for the rest of the content in that path. If you're doing like really conditional stuff. Like you really you you have to know a lot about like the inner nuances of Nginx uh, to really set up those kinds of rules properly. Um, whereas you know we just have a lot of those actions abstracted out with our Aries rule engine. Uh, so the end result is really it's easier for our support team to implement those rules. It's easier for anyone picking up uh, your account next time to understand what rules are active. Um, yeah, it's just a lot easier uh, to work with. It, we, we designed this Aries thing uh, and the rules engine for this use case. It's, it's for hosting websites, uh, primarily WordPress, but it can support a lot more. Nice. Yeah, and that readability, it sounds like easier to implement, but easier to maintain, which is a big thing. If, if people need yeah. to go back and you don't need to wade through some esoteric kind of hard to read syntax, that's gotta be a nice, nice feature of it. Um, okay, so let's let's jump to the next one, and this one seems kind of like the the bulk, like this was kind of the major meat of this whole relationship here. It sounds like was in this issue. Um, it sounds like, and let me tell me if I'm right here. And Devin, maybe you, you, I mean, obviously you were the one feeling the effects of this, but let me see if I can summarize it. It sounds like we were doing rate limiting, but we were getting uh, like false positives. We were we were uh, we were blocking out legitimate people that were just, uh, you know, they were starting to have licensing issues like they're because they weren't connecting to your licensing server uh, due to the rate limiting. And so the trick was really trying to calibrate that and salt, you know, make it work as best we could to keep the server alive without making you spend a lot of money on hardware just to keep it up while you developed a code fix. And it sounds like you, you were able to identify and work on a code fix but we kind of did a Band-Aid solution where we, we, we actually threw hardware at it to make it work in the short mm -hmm. term. Um, and can you maybe just like t take us back to, there, to that point? What was happening? What were your customers experiencing at that time? Yeah, so there's a couple different um, moving parts here. Um, one, you know, going back to the way that um, some of our customer sites were just hammering our endpoint and causing um, a lot of database queries to happen for their licensing lookups, subscription lookups, and this and there was no caching layer in our code that would be passing those that result back. Um, and then also the the solution or the band aid solution by Pagely, um, but then um, them also providing insight on who those sites were, and eventually us, you know, giving the go ahead to to start blocking some of them, um, you know, so we could actually work on a fix. And, um, you know, it's, it's never fun to have these kinds of issues because it takes, it distracts away from our core business functionality. But, you know, it's definitely uh, uh, an issue that needs to get resolved because our most important asset is our website. You know, it's where people go for support. It's where we make a lot of our revenue. So um, there was a recommendation to go to a, um, I believe, RDS, dedicated RDS, or is that what? Relational database, that's an AWS term, right? Um, yeah, a private, a private MySQL server, basically. Yourself. Yeah, so we still have that implemented today, and we noticed a, an immediate speed improvement when that happened. Um, we previously did not have that, I believe, before this. And then we also bumped up, I believe, to a VPS2, not during this time, but a little bit after that, uh, to give a little more uh, CPU power. And then uh, we recently, you know, got, took care of a lot of these sites that were having issues. So we, we were able to downgrade back to a VPS1. But the way that the, the architecture can scale up and down is really nice. Um, again, the costs are um, a little more sometimes than we want to spend for hosting. But we have to because, um, one, we need a, that reliable 
site and two we need time to work on our solution so you know we definitely appreciate all the support so we're just getting more than i'm sure uh is is the value is definitely there is what i'm trying to say yeah for sure armand from your perspective i was looking through the tickets and i noticed uh when you said we're going to have this work in more of a traffic shaping manner versus a rate limiting manner. Can you talk a little bit about what that distinction is and what you mean there? Uh, yeah. So when you have situations with, you know, random things out there hitting your site and you're trying to slow them down. Uh, if you just return a, a rate limited message right away, you're not going to slow them down they're most likely not paying attention to, to the responses they're getting from the server they're talking to. And so uh, one of the things that, that we can do very easily with Aries is we can delay the response on those requests that we, that we know are bad. We basically put them in the slow lane and we, we let the server go back to handling other requests that are valid and we put this one kind of to the side you know, we'll respond in 10 seconds, 15 seconds, instead of a second. And just by doing that, you're basically uh, regulating how fast that outside entity can hit your, hit your server. Because it, it's still waiting for a response to come back. So it's either going to hit some timeout it has configured for itself, or it's just going to sit there and wait for a response from you instead of making another request, which could you know, it could cause even more problems for you. Uh, if, you're, if you're blocking the request, now you have uh, even more requests coming in, and now you're consuming more bandwidth, and you're taking up more CPU power uh, from your server in, in returning a, a invalid or forbidden or re-inlimited message. Uh, so that's really the distinction there. If, if there's stuff that we, we know, if we just block it right away, it's just gonna keep coming back at a higher rate then we configure it to delay the response or we shape the traffic so that we're, we're pretty much calling the shots on how that's going to go. You know, we're not, we're not hoping that that thing making the request is going to listen to a rate limited message and slow down on its own. Yeah. So let me see if I can, cause I just got what I think might be a really good analogy here and, it, or it could be really weird, but this is what's in my head right now is I'm imagining if, let's say that Pagely has that, that there's just like a spammer trying to war dial Pagely and he's calling these numbers and he calls Armand and he says, Hey, is Armand there? Hey, is Sean there? Hey, is, is Josh there? It's like, if you just hang up on him right away, he's going to just keep calling back and call someone else. And so that's really going to not do anything to help you out in that scenario. But if you say, Oh, Hey, let me, yeah, Armand's here. Let me go get him," And then you just leave the phone off the hook. You're now kind of like, <laughs> that spammer is now kind of waiting indefinitely in a holding pattern until you get back to them. And so that it's, it's mitigating that uh, essentially like not DDoS, but it's mitigating that flood of traffic that's coming in. Is that a valid way to think about it? Yeah, that works. Okay. Hmm. That was just a weird thing that kind of popped into my head, but like it, uh, maybe for the less technical people that makes more sense. And that's certainly how I am yeah, hearing about it. Basically we're just putting it in the slow lane. You know, using using the features available and uh, at that layer of things. Cool. All right. Well, anything else on the rate limiting stuff? Because this was like having read all these tickets, it seemed like this was a good chunk of things was figuring out yeah. how to calibrate the rate limiting. Yeah. That's so cool. I mean, the, the the rules we that we used, you know, sort of evolved over the, the past couple of years. Um, I think the first implementations we had were resulting in, in some false positives. It was resulting in legitimate visitors getting blocked. Uh, so we kept refining those. And then I think I think the rules we have right now, uh, we, we switched them to Aries a few months ago. Uh, the rules we've been running uh, recently, I think, uh, have been pretty good for the most part. Um, you can you can correct me if I'm wrong about that, Devin. But uh, we've been trying to avoid blocking, you know, this IP or that user agent or that site. Uh, and we're trying to stick to like a more generic rule set that that applies automatically 
that uh, doesn't lead to false positives, hopefully. And you know, anything that's not doing a crazy rate is not even going to notice that there's any rules in play at all. Um, but anything that is going over that, then it will be, um, you know, it'll just be put in the slow lane, uh, like we just said, and it will it'll keep it from affecting the server. Um, but yeah, those those settings are all really uh, tunable on our end. You know, we can we can configure a bursting threshold, we can configure a maximum rate per second uh, that something should be hitting you at. Um, you know, we can do all kinds of things uh, to to fine tune that uh, if it's if it's still not working uh, as expected. Cool. Yeah, and it sounds like anytime you're just chasing specific domains or specific user user agents. It's just whack-a-mole, right? Because then it's yeah. just until the next one comes up, now you've just got to block that specific one. And so you really need to get to a more generic approach where you can address it via rule set, uh, which it sounds like we did. Yeah, and I mean, not just for this, but you know, all kinds of stuff. We see all kinds of traffic patterns and we're always adding new types of rules to, to our ARIES uh, default rule set. Uh, where we're looking for specific patterns that, that we've observed to cause problems for other sites, and we we sort of distill that down to everybody to benefit from from all those new rules. Um, and some of those are performance improvements. Uh, some of those are uh, just correcting bad behavior from from external sources. Uh, some of those are, are really good security uh, countermeasures. Uh, so and that that stuff all sort of you know happens. Uh, for every customer using Aries, uh, without them really noticing anything on their site changing, uh, ideally, you know, it doesn't cause any sort of uh, fallout. But we're always adding new rules uh, based on what we're seeing uh, happening to our our various customers. Cool. All right. Um, this next one is a fairly trivial thing, uh, trivial in the sense that we bump into it a lot, and so we have a solution for it. But it looks like. Easy Digital Downloads sets a cookie. They have a session start function. And so on the homepage of GiveWP, we were noticing it was bypassing cache. Um, can you talk about what we do there in terms of, I know we've got a MU plugin patch that we apply, but what is the solution for that issue? Yeah, um, so I, any caching layer that you use, uh, whether that's Varnish or Nginx or whatever, uh, the default behavior is if the response <laughs> contains uh, set cookie header line, uh, like set cookie PHP session ID is this, or set cookie, you know, some other custom cookie name. Um, so that, that's that's a very clear sign to the caching layer that this content is going to be personalized and that it should not cache it. So if you're doing something where it's resulting in your home page responding with, with set cookie, and your home page is not going to cache. And that's arguably the most popular page on your website in most cases. So uh, if the home page is not uh, hitting the cache, then your server is working harder. Uh, you need more CPU. You need more workers. Um, so the the fix there is a very simple uh, WordPress MU plugin that uh, just adds a filter, uh, where if your uh, the URL is the home page, then uh, it just removes that response. It just re removes that set cookie from the response before it sends it back out uh, to Nginx to process uh, the response to the client. Uh, so with that, with that small tweak, you know, we have the home page caching again, and it's not causing all this, uh, all these load issues anymore. Cool. Yeah, if I recall that correctly, I think it was more than just the home page. I think it was. Uh, Sessions are starting on almost yeah. every page. And yeah, we'd be starting it on every page. Uh, but I think I think the I think the MU plugin we had for you just removed it from the home page. But um, yeah, I remember doing some custom code for that too, and ensuring that it's only started on the necessary pages, like right. the checkout, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So. Um, there's a few different ways to address that kind of problem, right? Uh, there, there are some hosting setups out there that straight out, straight up ignore that set cookie line in the response. And they don't, they don't consider that a reason not to cache. Um, and I mean, that's that's obviously like the easiest way to do it, and not it doesn't generate a bunch of 
uh, supporting queries, like why isn't my stuff caching? This is basically a forced cache. Um, but it's really important to not do that <laughs> if, if there is actually a legitimate reason to have to have a session cookie per visitor. Um, so you know we have we have our stuff set up sort of by design, like okay, we're gonna stick to this standard of set cookie and the response means cache miss. It's gonna necessitate an interaction and a conversation with with our customers about it. And then we can work with them to establish uh, workarounds that would hide that response or address that issue in, within the application code so that it doesn't send that cookie out. Um, but you know, it, it requires a little more interaction and a little more more touches to to get to the bottom of something like that. But you end up with a better outcome, I think, because if you just indiscriminately cache any content, then you could end up caching something that's personalized. And you may, may you may be Bob, and you go load a page, and you see something for Sarah. You know, and that's that's not really what you ever want to do. Cool. All right, so there was just kind of a, a smattering of various tickets around CDN and SSL and and stuff like that. Uh, but I think the next meaty one was September 10th, uh, related to New Relic. And now, Devin, do you guys use New Relic? Because I know we use it in diagnosing stuff, but do you actually use that uh, as well? Hmm. Um, we used it on a suggestion for monitoring from, uh, from you guys. Um, so that was why we got on it. Um, I've used it previous to that um, over the years, but um, I believe that's why this was on our server. Cool. Uh, and it was just a unique thing that New Relic does. I believe it, the support team pointed out where exactly I can change this option to, um, I think it was the browser um, stats that they were, uh, that was this was causing. And that was just when you, uh, it's just one of these, again, very weird, um, unique situations with the nature of selling WordPress plugins and, um, and how this displayed um, in the customer's feeds when they were looking at uh, one portion of our plugin that pulls content from our site and brings it into the actual panel, sort of like a, an add-on directory within our, our GiveWP platform. So um, yeah, we didn't want to, to display that. Um, and uh, since then, it hasn't been a problem. But uh, again, the support team helped uh, you go find that option and turn it off. Cool. Yeah. So that that's a good example of something that's you know obviously we're not new relic, so it's it's hard for us to support it. But we can certainly be that router that uh, because we do bump into this type of stuff, we can then recognize it and then point you to the the right resource for solving it. Yeah, new relic's incredibly powerful, but there's a lot of things going on there. So I was appreciating that help there. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, Armand, on this next one, uh, MySQL column size too large. Can you talk us through what that is about with the whole MySQL NODB mismatch? Yeah, uh, so we, we use Amazon Aurora uh, for the most part. Like most of the sites that, that we host on Pagely are, are backed by an Amazon Aurora database server. And the uh, big difference between Aurora and a uh, regular MySQL engine or MariaDB engine is that it only supports NODB as the engine format. Um, if you've been using MySQL for a while, you probably have heard of MyISAM. And really, this is, this is where um, these kinds of compatibility issues start happening, is there are plugins out there. Many plugins have their database schemas if they are using any custom tables uh, inside of the WordPress database uh, really have been designed historically for my ISM uh, engine for the table format. Um, and so in this, you know, in this new world where everyone's using Amazon Aurora and uh, even without Aurora, you're using InnoDB because uh, it has a lot, a lot of better uh, features for uh, per row blocking. Uh, it's just, you know, it's a lot better. Uh, it runs a lot faster. It allows you uh, to do more things without dealing with so many locks, things like that. The data is more portable. Um, 
you have to take into account some of those differences in schema, basically. And so there's there's a couple things that you may have to change in, in your database schema before you create it. Um, but there isn't really, there aren't really that many situations where a slight tweak to the schema uh, would prevent you from uh, being able to use InnoDB instead of MyISM. Uh, but with that said, because we use Amazon uh, to host all our sites, uh, and because we offer private RDS instances for people if they want it or if they need it, then we can absolutely support a vanilla MySQL RDS or a MariaDB. And you, if you have some reason that keeps you from actually being able to use InnoDB or Aurora, uh, we can still accommodate that. And it's, it's the same pricing uh, regardless of what engine type you ask for. All right, so with a private RDS, we can accommodate whatever uh, table engine you need to use or database flavor. But in this scenario, we didn't actually even do that. We just, uh, there was like a, a coding, a SQL parameter, row format equals dynamic, yeah. it sounds like. Yeah, that's part of the schema. So yeah, in this case, they were able to just make a, a slight tweak to, to the schema and, and they were off and running. Cool. <clears throat> yeah, I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, this is like a proactive thing um, that Pagely did. I, I wasn't even aware of this. I think I was informed after the fact. And um, yeah, there's been one or two occurrences where that's happened. I've, and that's something really cool too. Proactiveness, right? That's important. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we certainly do. I know in a monitoring capacity, we try to head off issues before they manifest as downtime. So in a lot of situations, if we see some resource spiking up, we can actually get ahead of it. And before your site ever even goes down, we can at least uh, address the issue. So it mm -hmm. sounds like this was one of those cases. Cool. Uh, all right, well, moving on this next one, it's on my birthday, May 7th. Um, mm -hmm. So purging requests causing long response times. Uh, it sounds like this was addressed via a MU plugin. Armand, is anything, any lesson here or anything you want to comment on this one? Uh, yeah, so this this goes back to the uh, automatic purge hooks I was talking about. So whenever you update your pages or different posts, um, there's a hook that triggers that will go and issue a purge request uh, to the to the caching layer. And so uh, there are cases where sometimes you have a plugin or you're doing something with a custom post type, and uh, as you're as you're iterating through all these items or you have a cron that's updating a bunch of things that are of a custom post type, they're not necessarily, you know, pages on your website. It's just using a custom post type to, to do what it does. Um, and so we, we have, we have the ability to specify which custom post types to skip that purge hook for basically. And so if you have something that's updating a bunch of things and they're not really public facing pages, they're just custom posts, um, you really don't need all those items to get a purge uh, request made. And just the overhead of having to scan uh, all, the, all the items in the cache to know what's purge can add overhead. Uh, so that's a really simple workaround. We just, we add a, we add a new definition inside of, uh, the section where you exclude, you know, which which custom post type to exclude from the purge, um, and then that that just kind of stops the issue from happening. And of course, we log it as well, so you can see what is being skipped. Um, that's a, that's a good way to just have that extra sanity, just to know like, oh, this this is working or it's not working. Right. Cool. Uh, all right. So this next one, May fifteenth. Uh, it looks like we banned an IP block that was hitting it, the server, uh, creating excessive load. Um, I mean, we've kind of already addressed this whole how we do that uh, in terms of not just whack-a-mole with specific IP addresses, but trying to do a more robust approach via rule sets. Um, so I think we already covered that one. Uh, maybe we just skip over that one. Yeah. Yeah, so I think just the – it's still important to, to – to highlight that event because this this was before we added the the more generic rules. I think at that point they were already on Aries, but uh, we were we were maintaining a list of 
of sites or IPs uh, to to block. Uh, we hadn't we hadn't yet added the the more generic rate limiting traffic shaping policies. So I mean, it, it, it is good to maybe just make mention of it because, you know, it is it just continued to be a game of whack a mole basically uh, until we got the better rules in place. Here's a question about those rules and the way they work. Are we able, let's say we see the same pattern of behavior occur with all easy digital download sites and that we just come to find that there's a rule set that always makes sense. Are we able to, are those portable? Can we just apply, like move Aries rules amongst customers and actually repurpose those? Yeah, so we do that sometimes. Uh, if, if there are really um, generic and safe types of, uh, rules to apply everywhere, then, then we have done that in the past. Uh, we actually do that pretty regularly. Um, but it, it really depends. Um, you know, I think sometimes you do need it to be very custom tailored to, to each specific site. Um, I know, you know, we know how to dial it in for Devin because we've gotten a lot of good feedback from him. Uh, and it's, it has taken a lot of communication, uh, to understand like, okay, what what are the sites that you're that are running your plugin like supposed to be doing? And we've learned okay, there are some valid reasons for it to make six requests in a row, but there are not valid reasons for it to make six requests in a row every minute. You know, yeah. <laughs> so it's really you know it's it is possible to make uh, sort of generic rules that apply for everybody. Uh, in some cases, it, it still takes uh, a little custom tweaking here and there uh, to, fit, to fit the use case. Nice. So maybe that is a starting point. Like if we identify kind of best practices with WooCommerce or EDD and we can implement kind of a base rule set and then tweak them per customer, it sounds like that's kind of the happy medium there. Yeah. Cool. Um, and Devin, just again, kudos to you having reviewed all this support history. I agree with Armand. Like, uh, the just the the level of back and forth and on parity just uh, it, it's not always the case you know we wish that every customer had your level of patience and uh, you know interaction and whatnot with us but uh, it's it, good no, well, history of tickets there yeah no yeah, well, I appreciate it and uh, you know I've I've come to trust Pagely a lot and um, and then you know I. Sometimes feel bad for the number of tickets that I put in, but um, I, you know, I, I've repaid it with uh, good feedbacks and testimonials and um, and sponsoring pressnomics and stuff like that. So hopefully we're good to go. Yeah, you're, honestly, you're, you're, honestly, you guys are not even a pain to deal with. We we love working with you and we love helping you solve these problems. Cool. All right, moving on. Uh, July 11th, intermittent 503 errors. I think this is what we talked about before in terms of providing a Band-Aid fix through hardware. And even though it's, it, we, we don't like to go here first, you know, that to me, papering over it with a hardware fix is, we, do, we would far prefer to solve the root issue, which is what we normally do. But in this situation, it can be a valid thing. It sounds like you were working on a code fix at this point. So you really just needed to buy some time uh, with increased hardware. And, and yeah. that's exactly what we did there. Yeah, we started the code fix around that same time, and we're now just going to start finally rolling it out to production next week. Um, it's been tested uh, for the past week and a half on staging, and it's been going pretty well. So we're confident that we can bump it over to production next week. Cool. And what type of, like, rolling it out, so now when you do that, it's now suddenly available and people can start downloading it, but there's no guarantee every one of your customers is going to download it. What type of adoption do you see when you roll out a fix like that? Like what, how soon until it proliferates and people are actually all using it? Well, it's not really about like them downloading and updating because of course uh, I was, a lot of these WordPress sites and the nature of WordPress, they'll be on an older version for the lifetime of the plugin. So um, what Pagely has done is actually route that traffic through to a new server that we are controlling on our end. Um, and it's basically our licensing proxy server. And uh, it, they're just, uh, Pagely has just been uh, passing that through on staging and uh, looking for a user agent when it comes back. So there's 
kind of this complex loop that happens. Um, I'm not the primary developer on it, so I can just only give you the high levels on it. Um, but that way we can ensure that all these requests come over uh, over time. And we will push out a code update so that the endpoint URL will point to our new licensing server. But again, this will take years to proliferate through our entire ecosystem of users and maybe some will never get it. You know, WordPress is just talking now. Uh, I don't know if you saw a WP Tavern article about proactively updating old sites to 4.7. I'm like, yes, this is good, let's do it. Um, but then there's all these other people who are like, don't touch my code. I'm more in the mindset, let's, uh, let's all try to use the latest version. Um, yeah. you know, there's a reason why when you open up Chrome or some of these uh, other applications that they always keep it up to date. And um, I like controlling my, my customer's experience and environments, and it makes life a lot easier for us on the development endpoint. Yeah, it's certainly, I had a startup years ago called Jumpbox, and we dealt with distributing uh, software. We were specifically dis distributing virtual machines that contained wow. entire stacks of software. And so we intimately know just the pains as soon as you, it's no longer SaaS, as soon as you no longer control that environment where you can just update everything and know that it's all set. Now you've got just this, you know, unknown quantity of VMs out there at varying states and varying, you know, levels of security issues. Now it's a, what a nightmare. So. Uh, yeah. And not to come out, not to drone on about the subject, but like backwards compatibility too. We've written a lot of code to make sure that, this works with that version, this works with this version, and, and the add-on model too. You know, if I have a recurring donation plugin on 1.9.1 and the core is at a, a much lower version, they need to be able to talk properly. So we have to develop all these clever workarounds for just the nature of the business that we're in. Cool. Um, all right, well, so we're, we're getting close here to the one hour mark. Uh, looks like we've got two more issues to talk through. So I'm going to go to the July 25th cron. Uh, so this is, yeah. yeah. So well, do you want to? I'll just let you describe what was the issue. Yeah. So we were, we're we've been using Amazon SES for um, sending emails through our WordPress sites for a while now. Um, but the plugin we were using um, has been abandoned for about you know two three years, and I, I knew it was on shaky ground. Um, the guys at Delicious Brains, really great developers, have this WP Offload SES plugin, which is a much more improved experience and much more reliable plugin. Um, but I couldn't figure out why the heck it was working on our one WP Business Review site perfectly and not working on GiveWP. And um, I didn't, I had no idea, so I was like, all right, let's, let's ask Pagely. They usually know how to figure this out. And uh, we went back and forth on a couple different items, but they finally came back and said, hey, you know, it's the Curry's caching WP cron.php, which, um, which Offload SDS relies on to, to batch and send out these emails. And I'm like, wait, isn't this a service for WordPress? Like, why would they be caching this WP cron file? That doesn't make any sense at all to me. But lo and behold, they were. And so I had to go and submit a support request to Sakuri not to talk trash about them or anything, but it took them a couple, a much longer to figure that out. Um, but they finally did and it started working. Um, and now uh, our email system is up and running and reliable again. But, you know, Securi is um, finicky service at times. Yeah, well, that seems like something that would be applicable to pretty much everyone. So hopefully that's a, uh, hopefully they took that scenario and baked that in as a rule for, all sites, I would think, because I can't imagine a good reason to cache WP Cron. I have no idea why they would either, and I, I need to ask Tony or Dre or somebody over there to see what's going on. Cool. All right, well, last one here, and then we'll wrap up. So on August 5th, uh, endpoint redirect solution needed for EDD licensing queries. Um, I think, yeah. can you... Can you, I know you said that you've got the developer, so you can just talk only at a high level about it, but can you explain what the change w was made in terms of using Google App Engine and what you guys were doing there? Yeah, so we're using Google App Engine to run uh, a Lumen-based, Lumen is like a lightweight version of Laravel, 
And what that's doing is, um, and there's also a Redis caching layer in between, um, but essentially it's going to mitigate the work that our database does on Pagely to look up this uh, licensing checks, activation checks, um, all the different checks that uh, the plugin does to ensure you're up to date and you're getting the updates that you need. Um, all those are gonna be cached on our app engine and we're also tying into um, via WordPress hooks with our WordPress site. So if I go in and I release a new version of one of our add-ons, I click update, that's going to tell our proxy server, okay, you need to get some more additional data here so that when people check for updates, that they're going to get the proper version. The same thing goes for customer records. If I go into uh, John Doe's customer record and I put uh, – you know, a different name or whatever, that's going to fire a hook, update that customer record on the uh, proxy server so that when uh, his site comes and checks that he'll have that proper um, data that comes in there. That's kind of like the high level solution there. Um, and then again, going back pagely, I, we requested that they, um, they, they pass through all traffic to that endpoint to our new server. And then when we need to get data back from that endpoint that they only accept traffic coming from us. So we have a specific uh, user agent that they should be looking for. Cool, cool. And yeah, Armand, so that was all straightforward to add, or yeah, I was just gonna ask you what. Yeah, uh, uh, on our end, that was pretty easy to do. Uh, that was just matching on two conditions, uh, this location and uh, whether or not it's, it's this uh, authorized user agent. And then um, setting it upstream to be uh, the custom endpoint that they that they have running elsewhere. Uh, so again, that's really easy to do. I mean, you could do that with Nginx normally as well. You just do proxy pass uh, inside of a location block. Um, but yeah, that's something well, that we can really do. Cool that, it's really cool that Pagely helps and you know gives us that um, extra level of support because we we tried to do it on our own for uh, the Nginx rules and we were just like okay. This isn't working for us. Yeah. This is the last to do. It. Well, yeah, I mean, we we run into that same issue sometimes if we're just dealing with normal nginx, like uh, it's having trouble getting this rule to work properly sometimes. Uh, but that that's why we made Aries. Um, and I I could I'll send you uh, I'll send you Devin like a sample of, of what that rule looks like if you're curious uh, yeah. how how it's expressed in, in our Aries format. Uh, it might it might really Help, help you realize like how much easier it is <laughs> to do it our way. Uh, well, actually... I think uh, one of the developers that was working on this asked me, can you, can you send me what the rules they did? Cause I'm curious cause I couldn't get this to work. And then yeah. uh, I believe the response was like, Oh, we have our own way of doing it. And if, you know, but we'd still be interested to see how much more. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's, it's just a, it's just a bit of JSON code. It's not something that you could really load anywhere else cause it's, it's tied to our Aries uh, system, but uh, but yeah, it's it's a really uh, easy way to to match on different things that are usually a little more challenging, especially like multiple conditions, this URL and not this user agent um, or this user agent or whatever other parameter. Um, but yeah, uh, it's really easy for us to set up uh, either an outbound or inbound reverse proxy of anything custom. Uh, we can do normal HTTP, or we can do HTTPS. Uh, we can set up multiple targets. You know, it, it is still a load balancer uh, inside of Nginx that, that we can make use of. Um, so, yeah. And then if there's any issues with that, uh, we can we can easily see through, like logs on our side. Our gateway error logs can can show if there's any sort of uh, issues with the uh, with the secure connection negotiation. If there's something wrong with the way the request is being sent, maybe the host header is wrong or something like that. Um, but yeah, cool, cool. Well, fellas, we are right at the one hour mark, so I think that's probably a good place to wrap it up. Um, Devin, I wanted to give you the opportunity because we've been talking a lot about Give WP, uh, but you're involved in some other stuff, the WP Business Reviews and Give IO. Uh, I'll, I'll just give you the opportunity to plug whatever you'd like to plug here. Yeah, cool. So um, WP Business Reviews is um, a product that allows uh, anybody with reviews on um, the top uh, platforms like Yelp, uh, Facebook, and Google, including several others, to pull those reviews in, um, place them on their website, and also um, 
as you get new reviews over time, they'll also be pulled in. So there's some automatic um, aggregation there as well. You can use that for social proof. You can use that, um, you know, for testimonials. You can add your own testimonial style reviews in there. So it's pretty flexible on that. Um, that's a relatively new product. Um, but again, we're really focused on solutions for fundraising and nonprofits. Um, and um, there's also some integrations with some nonprofit services within that too. Um, but the main thing we're really working on too outside of GiveWP is um, a new uh, solution called GiveIO, which will um, be, it's a Laravel based application, um, also on Google App Engine. Um, it's just now getting sort of, um, we're about in the five months into development now. So our target is to launch that in, um, in uh, probably Q3 2020 next year. Um, so there's some time there. But really the focus on that is, um, the backbone of it is to um, get and retain the most recurring donors as you can. So everything about that platform will be built to focus on um, obtaining and um, maintaining a, a large recurring donor base. Um, so yeah, we're really excited about that. I'll have a lot more information on that next year, but um, it's the big thing we are working on right now. Very cool. Um, I actually run something called Charity Makeover on the side, which is just like a volunteer side project thing that I do, uh, essentially like periodic hackathons, pulling together stuff and implementing different you know, things for charities like that. Um, we used Ignition Deck on the last thing we built. Uh, it's a crowdfunding platform, but yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you need beta testers or anything, we, we'd love to maybe try that out and implement that for someone all pro bono. Awesome, for sure. Yeah, we're going to open it up uh, probably, you know, March, April next year uh, and really make sure that it's got solid ground before it's actually released. So I'll, uh, I'll definitely give you a call on that. Cool. All right, guys. Well, any final thoughts, Devin, for someone who's thinking about using Pagely? Uh, it sounds like you've had an overall positive experience. What would you say to someone who's considering working with us? Uh, absolutely. If you have custom situations or you need extra support uh, with super knowledgeable people, you don't want to maintain your own servers, uh, you want to focus on your business, um, which is at the core of what you do, uh, move to Pagely. I've tried every single, well, not every single, but almost every managed WordPress host under the sun. Um, and there's some really good ones for depending on what you want to do. You know, I've tried Kinsta, SiteGround, WP Engine, Liquid, you name it, I've tried it. And nothing's, uh, no level of support has been as good as Pagely. Um, not to mention the architecture and the server system. Just everything's good. It's a little bit more pricey than some of the others, but, you know, you get what you pay for. Cool, man. All right. Well, thank you so much, Armand. Thanks for your time today. Uh, we'll wrap it up there. And, fellas, have a great day. All right. Thank you. Cheers. Your time's up. See you.